Economics is not a complicated subject. It's simply the study of how people interact with things of value. The problem is that people are very complicated, and that can make economic assumptions that sound perfectly reasonable in theory inaccurate or just wrong. Economics is also a subject which, for better or worse, is intertwined with politics, personal opinions, and our quality of life on a personal, national, and global level. Most economists agree on 99% of the study's subject matter, and that last 1% is made up mostly of either misunderstandings or ideologies. Economic ideologies are also easy to understand. Some people believe in a more egalitarian culture where people look out for other people, and others see the merits of, uh, well, a meritocracy where people contributing the most are rewarded the most to incentivize everybody to work as hard as they can to produce more wealth overall. Now, we can make endless videos about that debate, but for now it's more efficient to just focus on the economic misunderstandings. Two in particular actually, which are economies of scale and induced demand. You've likely heard these two terms used to justify everything from city planning and business growth to entire national economic policies. Induced demand in particular has become a favourite of a lot of economists and commentators arguing that building more infrastructure will actually deliver worse results. A really interesting idea, if it's true. The only problem is that almost everybody that talks about these two economic theories talks about them wrong or at least leaves out a lot of details that could change the arguments for or against some really important decisions that people will need to make. How we vote on what our cities look like, what companies get allocated the capital they need to grow, and what industries we build our economies around all depend on us having a good understanding of these theories. If nothing else, the microeconomics of it all is really interesting. So what is everybody getting wrong about economies of scale? What is everybody getting wrong about induced demand? And then what can these theories actually be used for in order to explain real economic events? Economies of scale is the basic economic theory that as an individual institution or even entire economy produces more of a particular good or service, the unit cost of that good or service is reduced. This is not incorrect, but people assume that it means that just because an institution is making more of something, that it'll automatically be cheaper, which is not always correct. And it can actually do the opposite and make things more expensive. We can see this happening with a basic thought experiment. Imagine that you are told to make one single belt buckle from raw materials. It would cost you a lot of money to get started because you would need to buy the tools needed to melt metal down and cast it into shape. Let's say you spend $200 on a basic furnace, crucible, and belt buckle shaped mould. You'd also need to buy $4 worth of steel to melt down and pay $1 for the electricity or the fuel to run the furnace. That one belt buckle would cost you $205 altogether, which is very expensive and not economically competitive. If you made two belt buckles though, you could use the same tools again and you would only need to pay an extra $5 for the additional steel and electricity. This means that each buckle now only costs $105, which is still not great, but it's almost half the price of the first belt buckle. The tools are fixed costs, as in no matter how many belt buckles you'll make with them, they're always going to have cost $200. The steel and energy to run the furnace are variable costs, which means that every extra belt buckle you make, you need to pay an extra $5 for those inputs. I know this is incredibly basic to most of you watching, but it's important to have a really good understanding of the basic concepts to understand how this plays out in the real world. Now as we make more and more belt buckles, the basic theory of fixed and variable costs would suggest that the price of each belt buckle would trend towards $5 as the fixed $200 cost becomes less and less significant towards the total cost of each belt buckle. If you made 1 million belt buckles, then you would have paid $5 million for the steel and fuel and $200 for the machinery that you needed to cast them into shape. $5,200,000 divided by $1 million is near enough makes no difference, $5. You might also expect that someone ordering that much steel and paying for that much electricity would be able to get a bulk discount from their suppliers, so the unit costs might end up being even lower. Economies of scale in a nutshell. This is great for you as a belt buckle business owner because you can bring a more competitive product to market, and it's also great for the broader economy because it gets supplied with an abundance of cheap belt buckles. Unfortunately, this oversimplified example is leaving out a lot of important details. A $200 furnace probably won't be able to melt down that much steel before either breaking or taking so long to produce belt buckles that you would be forced to invest in a bigger machine. If we assume for the sake of our example that the furnace would break predictably after the 1000th belt buckle, then the unit cost of producing 999 belt buckles would look like this, but the cost of producing 1000 belt buckles would look like this. This is called a diseconomy of scale, where producing more has increased the unit cost of production. This happens the entire way along the production scale, even with a basic item like belt buckles. At some point you'll need to invest into a warehouse to keep all of your materials and products. You might need to hire additional workers to help you make all of those belt buckles and invest into big machines that can make belt buckles quicker than a basic $200 furnace can. Every time a big investment is made into the production process, it increases the unit cost of a belt buckle before those costs are spread out over enough units for it to make sense. Economists call this the short-term economies of scale curve, and they look like this. 
peaks have increased costs with a general trend downwards. Ok, so it's not a perfectly smooth process, but overall things are still getting cheaper. Well, that's true, until we run into the problem of long term diseconomies of scale. After a certain point, buying more electricity and steel won't get you bulk discounts, it'll drive up total market demand for those goods and services, making them more expensive. The belt buckle business might also run out of people that want to work around hot furnaces all day, so they'll need to start paying people more to get enough workers to make that many buckles, and slowly every additional belt buckle actually ends up costing more. There is an optimal amount of output, and beyond that, no matter how much the business tries to lower their costs, they are only going to go up. Generally, long term diseconomies of scale only impact very large industries operating on an economy wide level, but it's still important that people understand that just throwing the term economies of scale at a problem doesn't solve everything, it can sometimes make it worse. Whether that's building rockets to go to Mars, train lines to connect every city in China, or just making cheap appliances to keep people's pants from falling down. If a business or government program is claiming that some new scheme will work because economies of scale will make everything cheaper, make sure to take that claim with a healthy amount of scepticism, and maybe even ask questions about specifics of what they expect the unit cost of a good to be at a certain level of output. Assuming that producing more will just automatically make things cheaper has caused some serious economic mistakes in the past. The Chinese government has built out over 40,000 kilometres of high speed rail in the past two decades. They assumed as they built more that every extra kilometre would become cheaper, but it didn't. It got more expensive as the country started to single handedly drive up global iron ore prices to fuel development projects like this. The rail lines also went from making short, obvious connections between major population centres across accommodating terrain to long, dumb connections between remote villages with small populations over mountain passes and deserts. The cost of providing high speed rail never got low enough to make it competitive with airlines, which are much faster over a country as big as China, and in many cases, cheaper too. This blunder has left the Chinese government run State Railway Group with $900 billion worth of barely affordable debt. That's alone bigger than the GDP of most countries in the world, that could have been avoided with a better understanding of economies of scale. The development of public transport infrastructure also falls victim to another economic myth that more and more people are talking about, which is induced demand. Induced demand is the theory that as the supply of something increases, the demand for it will increase in unison. This theory does not apply to every good or service. You couldn't produce a million belt buckles and expect that a million people automatically have loose fitting pants. It mostly applies to public services, and a classic example is highways. The theory is that as highways add additional lanes to accommodate more cars, then more people choose to use the highway, which means that traffic doesn't get any better. This claim is normally backed up by a picture of a 16 lane highway that still has a traffic jam. Outside of toll roads, most people don't pay a direct price to use a public highway. So if capacity expands, there is no incentive for people not to drive on them, and so during peak hours, no matter how big the highway gets, it will always be pushed to capacity. This theory also extends to suggest that the answer to combating congestion is not adding capacity to roadways, it's actually removing roadways. Now before we get into the problems with this theory, I want to make the big disclaimer. Which is that while I love the creators and commentators calling for everybody to ride bikes or catch trains to get around, and I do understand the benefits of those modes of transportation from an environmental and city planning perspective, I love my car. I love driving in an isolated cocoon of steel and leather, and it doesn't matter how compelling the economic argument is for using a train or a bike, I have been caught out in bad weather and crammed into an overcrowded BO scented metal box too many times in my life to ever give up something that can take me from door to door while I sing along to my own terrible music without getting judged. Sorry Adam something, I know I'm everything wrong with the world. But anyway, yeah, I'm certainly not immune to biases, and that's important to acknowledge when assessing the validity of an economic theory. So with that out of the way, the induced demand theory was popularised by a study conducted by Giles Durrington and Matthew Turner titled The Fundamental Law of Road and Congestion. The paper compared the daily kilometres of interstate highway driving with the total lane kilometres of interstates across the United States. The paper found that between 1983 and 1993, interstate lanes grew by 32%, while driving grew by 77%. Between 1993 and 2003, lanes grew by 18% and driving grew by 46%. So it does seem like an increase in road capacity leads to an increase in road usage, but that might be making the mistake of assuming that correlation equals causation. Another way to explain what is happening here is that as populations and car ownership increased, governments just built more roads to keep up with demand, not the other way round. The study does try to account for this, and it uses some maths and assumptions to create an elasticity of demand figure for one kilometre of highway driving. Elasticity of demand is a measure of how much demand changes for a given change in price. 
For example, if the price of belt buckles drops by 10% and the demand for them increases by 15%, then the elasticity of demand for this product is 1.5, which is what economists call relatively elastic because demand changed more than the price. If the price dropped by 10% and demand only increased by 5%, then the elasticity of demand would be 0.5 and economists would call this relatively inelastic demand. This is easy to see for products that you have to pay for, but all of the highways in this study were free to use. So how do they work out elasticity of demand if there was no prices? The answer is that people don't always pay for things exclusively with money. When they're driving on a highway, they are paying for that service with the petrol they are burning to power their vehicle and the time that they're spending in that car that could have been spent elsewhere. There is also a fixed cost of buying a car. This is just an indirect form of opportunity cost. By choosing to drive a car, people give up petrol money, some time, as well as wear and tear on their vehicle that they'll eventually need to replace, when they could have just taken some other form of transportation or simply stayed at home. If it's cheaper and faster to drive down a highway than it is to catch a bus or a train, then people will always choose to drive. If public transport options are faster or cheaper than driving a car, then a lot of people won't be willing to pay the price of car usage and will choose to take a train instead. Expanding roadways reduces the cost that car drivers bear when they choose to drive over choosing other transport options. The study by Duranton and Turner summarised that for every extra 1% of interstate laid, drivers would choose to drive 1% more because more roadways makes travelling by car cheaper because it's faster. Faster travel means less money spent on fuel and less wasted time, so prices decrease and demand increases. This is not creating or inducing demand, it's just moving demand. If we draw a market diagram, it would look like this. This is the supply of roadways and this is the demand for those roadways. As the opportunity cost of travelling by road increases, people will use those roads less and less. If a big new highway project increases the supply of roads, then the supply line will go from here to here. This shifts demand from here to here. What it doesn't do is create entirely new demand like this. What the study didn't say was that people were stuck in traffic more. You might think a 1% increase in road usage with a 1% increase in roads would mean that people spend the same amount of time in traffic. But new roadways, especially interstates, tend to be more direct and can take a larger volume of traffic than alternative routes through urban areas. The study itself has also been widely criticised for making assumptions that other economists were not able to replicate in follow-up studies. Its methodology was also questionable. It measured interstate kilometres travelled. Building out more interstates might make people use those roads more, but that doesn't mean that there are more cars overall because a lot of that traffic would have been taken away from non-interstate roads which were not measured in the study. Driving on these kinds of roads is actually worse for everyone because it's slower for drivers and causes more noise and air pollution closer to where people actually live. Even if we assume that this research is absolutely flawless, this is not the argument for induced demand that you think it is. More roads won't create more congestion unless they are designed very poorly, and reducing the supply of roads won't ease congestion either. Duranton and Turner said as much in their actual study. The solution to congestion was not reducing roadways or even offering public transport options. The only solution they found was to increase the cost of driving a car through congestion charges. To be clear, public transport does have a lot of other benefits. It offers mobility to people who can't drive or can't afford a car. It is much more environmentally friendly, and it can make city centres much nicer places to live without the noise and pollution of thousands of cars taking up narrow streets. These by themselves should be enough to motivate public investment into this kind of infrastructure. We don't need to use poorly interpreted economic theories from a hotly debated study that didn't even make the findings that people are claiming it did. People waste millions of hours every year in traffic or waiting for public transport. Finding an efficient solution to the problem of getting people to where they need to go is hard enough without confusing ourselves over economic theories that sound interesting but aren't at all reliable or even relevant. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.